Welcome to the National Press Club, the world's leading professional organization for journalists. I'm Michael Friedman, the 113th president of the National Press Club. I'm the former general manager of CBS Radio Network, now journalist in residence at University of Maryland Global Campus and executive producer of the Kalb Report public broadcasting series moderated by journalist Marvin Kalb. We thank you for joining us today for our first virtual newsmaker program of 2021 with Dr. Susan Bailey, the 175th president of the American Medical Association. We're pleased to accept questions from our journalists tuning in today. I will ask as many as time permits. To submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. Since January 21st, 2020, just shy of one year ago, more than 373,000 people across the United States have now lost their lives to COVID-19, with the total number of cases topping 22,300,000, according to the Centers for Disease Control. Dr. Susan Bailey joins us today as COVID-19 cases continue to soar across our nation. And with the development of two vaccines, relief cannot come soon enough. Dr. Bailey will discuss lessons learned from COVID-19 in 2020 and what the AMA believes is needed now to prevent further infection and ensure widespread vaccine distribution. A native of Fort Worth, Texas, Dr. Bailey has been an allergist and immunologist in private practice for more than 30 years. An advocate for physician autonomy and private practice, Dr. Bailey has held numerous leadership positions within the AMA, including speaker and vice speaker of the organization's House of Delegates, chair of both the advisory panel on women in medicine and the AMA Council on Medical Education. Her service in organized medicine extends to the local and state levels as well, where she has served as board chair and president of the Tarrant County Medical Society and as vice speaker, speaker, and president of the Texas Medical Association. Dr. Bailey, welcome to the National Press Club. And thank you, Michael, and thank you to the National Press Club for the opportunity to address your members and the public about the current state of the COVID-19 pandemic and what happens next. We have arrived in 2021 with much hope, but many questions about the year ahead. There's a seismic change in leadership at the federal level with a new administration and new members of Congress. There are two safe and effective vaccines for COVID-19 now that are in circulation with other promising vaccines in the late stages of development. Millions of physicians, nurses, and other frontline healthcare workers have already received the first doses of a vaccine. So too have other high risk communities. But the reality is that this novel coronavirus remains a very deadly foe, and we are far from the finish line. Our country records about a million new confirmed COVID-19 cases every week. And just last week, our country reached the grim milestone of 4,000 dead to COVID-19 in a single day, far more than the number of Americans lost on 9-11. Many areas of the country are experiencing record case surges that are flooding emergency departments and intensive care units. In other areas, first responders are having to make agonizing choices about whom to treat for routine health emergencies to ease overcrowding at local hospitals. With hospitals stretched at or near their breaking points, some are even forced to treat patients in cafeterias and hallways and conference rooms. Meanwhile, a new and more contagious variant of COVID-19 that has been wrecking havoc in the UK has now been discovered in the United States. Still, far too many physicians and other healthcare workers lack the personal protective equipment they need to keep themselves and their loved ones safe. Frontline responders are exhausted. They're burned out and they wonder how much longer they can last. And while safe and effective vaccines are at hand, the distribution mechanisms at state and local levels have been slow, inconsistent, and severely hampered by unrealistic expectations and a lack of coordination at the federal level. 
This inaction at the highest level of our government has placed yet another daunting burden on the shoulders of state and local officials who lack the resources, sufficient guidance, and the support they need to handle a health emergency of this magnitude on their own. We've learned much in our response to COVID-19 in 2020. <clears throat> Excuse me. The painful lessons of our long national nightmare run deep. But the most important lesson for this moment and for the year ahead is that leaving state and local officials to shoulder this burden alone without adequate support from the federal government is not going to work. 50 different strategies across 50 different states will continue to sow confusion and slow the process. The urgency of this moment demands a comprehensive and coordinated federal response. As president of the American Medical Association and a champion for physicians and patients across the country, I call upon the incoming Biden administration to implement a national strategy and provide states and local jurisdictions with additional resources, guidance, and support to enable rapid distribution and administration of vaccines. The AMA urges the Biden administration to talk with states to identify gaps in vaccine distribution and to work collaboratively to address areas of concern. And we call for the new administration to develop a more robust national strategy for continued COVID-19 testing and production of PPE by tapping into the full powers of the Defense Production Act. <clears throat> This is a time when leaders must stand tall. We cannot afford to give any ground to this deadly virus by repeating the mistakes that contributed to so much heartbreak and suffering in 2020 and in the early part of this year. Yes, we have entered a new phase of this pandemic with vaccines, but one no less dangerous than before. It's crucial that we move ahead with urgency and action and with a new spirit of coordination and cooperation in Congress, across the federal government, and in every state and community. The lessons from 2020 have given us new insights into the persistent gaps, inequities, and barriers that plague our health system and that prevent far too many people in the U.S. from accessing the kind of care they need. In addition to providing greater guidance and support to states and developing a national strategy around testing and PPE, there are five other steps we must take to improve our health system and ensure nothing like this will ever happen again. At a time when misinformation and disinformation spreads rapidly online, we must work with great purpose to restore trust in science and in science-based decision-making among policymakers and the public at large. Whether you're a physician like me or a journalist, or whether you simply post your ideas on Facebook and Twitter, all of us share some responsibility for stopping the spread of disinformation and for creating an environment where science and evidence rule the day. We must insist that our elected officials affirm science, evidence, and fact in their words and actions. And we must insist that our government's scientific institutions, including the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the FDA, and others, are free from political pressure and that their actions are guided by the best available scientific evidence. Politics have no place in a pandemic. And never again should scientists, researchers, or physicians feel the weight of intimidation or have the integrity of our work questioned. <clears throat> the second action we must take is to ensure that our health system provides all people from all backgrounds and communities with access to affordable and meaningful health coverage. As certain provisions of relief packages from the beginning of the pandemic expire, Many Americans are still facing tremendous difficulties and hardships, some dealing with the loss of a job or a business or an eviction notice. In this new year, we urge the federal government to take necessary measures to protect not only lives, but livelihoods at risk. Measures such as a second enrollment period for the Affordable Care Act. 
Third, we must work collaboratively and intentionally to remove health inequities that have for too long left communities of color on unequal footing in our health system and our society. The data from COVID-19 is painfully clear. Communities of color have been disproportionately impacted by this pandemic because of systemic inequities that are rooted in racism. Heart disease, diabetes, other chronic conditions that have led to devastating consequences for African-American, Latino, and indigenous communities, these have also made them more susceptible to the dangers of COVID-19. The road ahead demands that our health system acknowledge these inequities and work to integrate new policies to level the playing field in all communities. The AMA takes this work very seriously. Last fall, the AMA explicitly recognized racism as a public health threat and pledged to mitigate its effects by supporting anti-racism policy, research, and prevention. Fourth, we must improve public health domestically and globally. We do that by protecting the patient-physician relationship from outside influence at all costs. This means influence from government overreach and strict political ideology that can erode trust and stifle open and free conversations between patient and doctor. We do it by prioritizing physician health and well being and working to remove administrative burdens that slow our ability to respond in a health emergency. And we do it by revitalizing our gutted public health infrastructure. Decades of disinvestment and neglect have left us unable to effectively handle a widespread health crisis like COVID-19. <clears throat> Excuse me. In the last 13 years, we lost 40,000 jobs at the state and local public health agencies with the local health, local health department workforce shrinking about a quarter. Now, of course, we're seeing the impact of this disinvestment play out today in the slow vaccine rollout we're witnessing. Marginalized and minority communities and people living in rural areas have also suffered the consequences of this disinvestment for too long. We need to rethink our system and who it's designed to serve and invest in an infrastructure that actually supports our culturally ethnically and geographically diverse people. And finally, we cannot act as if our country exists in isolation. We must recognize the global community of health providers and healthcare institutions and lead these efforts as we are called to do. Global alliances in healthcare are critical in helping prevent future threats before they sweep our planet. We applaud the incoming administration's commitment to rejoin the World Health Organization and are eager to help shape policy for the betterment of mankind. All of us want this to be over, but how we respond to the urgency of this moment and the lessons we take from the last year will go a long way toward correcting the longstanding problems of our health system and preventing new tragedies from occurring. These next few months are critical and we must allow science to lead the way. This means heeding the advice of scientists and experts by continuing to wear masks outside the home, to wash our hands and to physically distance as much as possible. It's been inspiring to see physicians and healthcare workers around the country post photos on social media after receiving their vaccinations. I share photos of my initial shot a couple of weeks ago, and I hope this continues to remind people that we are all in this together. When it comes time for everyone to get the vaccine, it's critical that we have the facts straight and that we communicate them clearly. The vaccines made available by the FDA were authorized by using all the necessary checks and balances and the scientific rigor that we require of any vaccine just like the ones that have brought an end to widespread transmission of polio, smallpox, and the measles. Scientists and researchers who authorize vaccines are not driven by political agendas. They're driven by vigorous standards for safety and efficacy and by the importance of their work. They know that science can save lives and end suffering. We know this is a challenging time for many Americans and that there is misinformation circulated widely around the internet. 
but there are also many credible fact-based resources provided by the CDC, the FDA, and others about the vaccine process and what led us here. Because at the end of the day, when it's your turn to get the vaccine, your only remaining question should be left arm or right. We won't get through the final months of this pandemic by wishing it were over. The stakes are far too high and each of us has an important role to play. Elected officials, policymakers, public health officials, physicians, journalists, and the public at large. We have to remain strong and steadfast and we have to adhere to the advice of experts and scientists who will continue to light our way. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Once again, we're pleased to accept questions from our journalists tuning in today. Uh, to submit a question, please email headliners at press.org. And now let's go to some of the questions that have been submitted by our uh, journalist members of the National Press Club. Um, our first question, and it addresses um, what you've just been uh, talking about, is the national strategy the AMA is urging the Biden administration to take different than what President-elect Biden is proposing? And if so, um, how? Well, I'm not sure I can completely answer that question at this point in time. My understanding is that the Biden administration is going to release its um, formal plans later on this week. Um, we are uh, a little bit concerned about the announcement that um, HHS will not hold back uh, vaccine doses to make sure that everyone who's gotten their first dose um, that will have a second dose in reserve. We really don't have adequate data to tell us if uh, one dose is sufficient. We don't think it is. Uh, and how long you can wait for your second dose without losing the benefits of the first dose. But we really need the federal government to help local providers where they are. Some communities are doing a pretty good job of rolling out the vaccine now. Some communities are not. Uh, there are rural areas. In fact, I talked to a patient this morning, even though I'm president of the AMA, I'm still seeing patients on a regular basis. And there was one pharmacy in her entire county that was administering vaccines. And she didn't know when she was going to be able to get hers. So, um, it's important that we make sure that vaccine uh, is available to everyone when they need it. And there's many concerns about um, you know, equitable distribution. You've laid out a very substantive uh, set of recommendations for the incoming Biden administration. Um, we're a year into this now. Um, is, there a, is there a feeling that, I, that one year in now we need to retool and put new engines on an airplane that's already in the air. Uh, there, there are challenges along the way here. How do you see this playing out? <laughs> oh, I think the plane in the air just needs more fuel. Um, I believe that um, healthcare workers are doing all they can to take care of critically ill COVID-19 patients in hospitals. Um, we need to make sure we put more fuel in the system by making sure that those healthcare providers have the PPE that they need. Um, um, even though the numbers are much better they were than at the beginning of the pandemic, there are still shortages of PPE. It's still being um, conserved very carefully. And physicians that, that are not in hospital-based settings are having a hard time competing with large health systems for the same units of PPE and can't compete with them on price or uh, quantity. Um, we do think that we need to fuel the system um, to keep the vaccine um, production going. We need to make, you know, we think that there's going to be plenty of vaccine, but when that vaccine is going to be available is going to be very important to local health authorities so that they can then plan their uh, administration plans. Uh, and we need to continue to fuel, fuel the ongoing vaccine trials. Um, there are two that may come up uh, for uh, FDA review in February, we hope, and there's even more down the line. Uh, and I think we're going to need all the tools in our toolbox to, to, to defeat this. So I don't, I don't think we need to retool the plane. We just need to make sure it's got enough gas to get to the finish line. Terrific. So 
Uh, we don't need new engines. We just need more fuel to, uh, to fire up. Um, I'm going to go back to something that you mentioned earlier and a question that, uh, that has come in. President-elect Biden, as you mentioned, plans to accelerate vaccination distribution when he takes office and release all available doses of the two-dose Pfizer and Moderna vaccines instead of holding back uh, millions of doses to guarantee that people receive their second shots. To be clear, um, he's not recommending that the two-dose vaccines be split in half in order to double the supply, but rather expedite the shipments of first doses to more Americans and use his powers as president to uh, provide the required second doses in a timely manner. Um, so uh, owing to this, just, just clarify for us whether the AMA supports this strategy for uh, distribution and um, if you could uh, elaborate a little bit on the potential advantages and the, and the challenges of, of doing it this way. In general, the AMA supports getting as many vaccines and as many arms as possible uh, and observe the priority categories that were laid out by the National Academy of, of Medicine as well as the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Um, I do have a bit of concern for individuals that have already received their first dose, especially individuals that have received the Pfizer vaccine. Um, it, it, it's not recommended anywhere that you mix brands, that you get Pfizer for your first one and Moderna for the second one. That is not recommended at all. Uh, and since the Pfizer vaccine has such um, rigid uh, storage uh, requirements, uh, I want to make sure that there's plenty of Pfizer vaccine for those initial, mostly frontline healthcare workers who got the Pfizer vaccine because it was the first one to come out in December. Uh, I want them to be able to get their second doses on time and not have to wait. Um, we do. We hope that there is going to be plenty of supply, but again, this is something where local uh, and state health departments really need uh, communication with. Uh, the FDA and federal authorities about, okay, how much vaccine are you going to get when? Which brand is it going to be? Um, can, do, are we sure that all of our people who got their first dose are really going to be able to get their second dose um, in the right time frame? It sounds like what you're saying is that not only do we need the national strategy that you're calling for, but a longer term strategy for this insofar as you mentioned uh, uh, the loss of um, local officials in, in, in state and local health departments over uh, an extended period of time of decades. Uh, um, it's going to take some time, even if we ramp up as quickly as possible, I think, to, uh, to remedy that challenge out there now. So it sounds like it's going to require um, uh, a really effective and substantive strategic plan for years to come. Yes, I think that's right, Mike. And, and I think even just over the course of, of 2021, you know, my crystal ball tells me that, um, you know, eventually, you know, right now we've got an incredible demand uh, for vaccine um, in patients that are in very high priority categories, uh, those with um, underlying health conditions, frontline healthcare workers, those in long-term care facilities, uh, essential workers, et cetera. When we get through most of those, and I'm not sure at what point in time that will be, um, our strategy is going to need to change from all hands on deck, as many shots and as short a period of time as possible to a strategy that is focused more on um, physician's offices, that's focused more on those that um, have um, doubts about vaccine, um, folks that have um, that are concerned about vaccines. Um, they don't mind sitting back and waiting right now at all. Let everybody else go first. Uh, but once those that are vaccine hesitant, once it comes to their turn, um, we need to have a completely different message to the public. And so this is one that I think we need to prepare for in advance. Uh, we've, the AMA has been working with the Ad Council and um, other organizations around the country to, you know, to craft messages for the public to combat 
vaccine hesitancy. Um, and so I, I think it, it's going to be a, uh, you know, that that plane will not have landed and it may need to, to go to different airports than it originally had planned. And have you been working with the transition team for the incoming administration? Are your um, are your plans already known to them or um, have you been developing them and uh, and announcing them now? We have we have been working with uh, well we worked with um, you know both teams prior to the election and have been working with the Biden transition team um, since November. Uh, we communicate with them on a regular basis and have and make our concerns known uh, and have let them know that we are happy and interested in helping in any way that we can uh, to help make sure that our physicians have the information that they need uh, to provide vaccine and take the best care of their patients um, and then get that message out to the public. And speaking of getting the messages out to the public, and we'll talk along the way here about the role of journalists um, in, in covering the, uh, the pandemic and get some thoughts from you on that. Uh, let's talk about public health guidance uh, to the public. Um, we do see, hear, and read a lot of stories about people who uh, make calls, they wait, online for a long period of time. Um, they, uh, they end up in a hang-up situation, whether inadvertently, uh, um, uh, uh, and they, uh, they're having difficulty getting um, some good guidance um, at this point. How big an issue is that? Uh, because your goal here is to effectively help people understand the value of the vaccine. Um, but without the guidance uh, in advance of that, that seems like the mountain just got a little taller. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it's it's going to be important at some point in time um, to um, separate the guidance from the um, the logistics. It's um, physicians are um, you know I answer. I, I devote every part of the, my appointments now with my patients to questions about COVID and questions about vaccines, because uh, I want to make sure that every patient um, has the opportunity. I'll say, hey, as long as you've got a doctor here, you know, do you have any questions ab about this particular thing? And they virtually always do. And, and many of the questions are, well, you know, when and where can I get my vaccine? And I have to say, stay tuned. Um, and so, you know, but, Sometimes just preparing someone to be mentally ready to get the vaccine is the first step, um, and then we can move them a little bit farther down. Um, and, and along those lines, um, I just heard uh, earlier about a special initiative in San Antonio, Texas, um, which was a, a vaccine event uh, for individuals that didn't have broadband access or smartphones and weren't able to sign up for appointments online. Um, it was strictly a call in and I think even uh, a, a drop in kind of basis. And, and I hear that they didn't dis distribute all of their vaccines. I hear that it didn't go as well as they were hoping that it would. Um, and so, and then again, you've got patients in rural areas who are, you know, love to get a vaccine, but there aren't enough distributors in their areas. So um, th this is one area where I think the federal government really needs to listen to the unique needs. You know, what one county needs is not what another county is going to need. Talk a little bit about dealing with COVID fatigue um, among people after, you know, in, in a lot of cases, more than 10 months of uh, isolation, um, people working from home, people losing their jobs. Um, and now we have two approved vaccines. And um, how do you keep people from saying, as long as I know I'm gonna get a vaccine, then I no longer need to wear a mask. I no longer need to follow the applied rules um, because I'm gonna be okay. You know, not only do we need to continue to wear masks uh, until we get the vaccine, we need to keep con wearing masks, washing hands and social distancing after we get our vaccines, uh, because we still don't know at what point in time um, you're not able to transmit virus to other people uh, and they're not able to catch it from you. And so um, getting your second dose of the vaccine is not the... Um, 
it, that's not the plane landing. That's not the end of the story. It's, um, it's just one step in the journey. And we need to um, be very, um, speak with a unified voice. You know, all of our public health authorities, we really need uh, journalism's help with this, uh, making sure that people understand that they still need to keep doing the public health measures that we hope that they've been doing all along. But COVID fatigue is real. We're all tired of it. We all want to go back to uh, the way things were, although I'm sure, I'm not sure we'll ever, what the new normal is going to look like. But it's, we're just not there yet. And I, I think a, um, a, Along with COVID fatigue, I think we have um, some COVID numbness. And I think that many of us have become um, desensitized to the, um, the horrifying numbers that you yourself you know, stated at, in your introduction about the numbers of cases um, and the numbers of deaths. Um, I made a speech to the AMA in early November um, and at that point in time, we were shocked that we had gotten to a thousand um, deaths a day. That was only two months ago. And now we're seeing up to 4,000 deaths a day. Someone dies of COVID in the United States every 25 seconds or so. And um, it's, it's easy to become numb to these numbers because we don't want to see them. We don't want to, we don't want to think about it, but virtually everybody now knows someone who's had COVID or has died of COVID. And, um, and so it's, it's reaching much more of us on a personal level. Um, but the increased uh, amount of depression that we're seeing uh, decreased um, deaths from opioids and overdoses uh, because of the isolation. Of course, the the economic um, situation that many families are in it's a it, it's just a really really tough time right now. But we've all got to stick together uh, to make sure that we get to a good end to this journey. You mentioned in your talk um, the issues that are health professionals are facing along the way as well. How are your docs doing in all of this after after a year of such intense work? They're exhausted. Um, and it's, in, it's interesting in that the frontline health work docs that are in the emergency rooms that are lung specialists, cardiac specialists that work in the ICU, um, they are, they've been running on fumes uh, for a long time. They definitely need more jet fuel. But then on the other side, there are doctors who are having to close their practices because they don't have enough patients to see because of local shutdowns combined with fears of patients um, still going out into public. Um, a survey released by the Physicians Foundation last year um, suggested that as much as nine to ten percent of private practices uh, would 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 close would be gone um, because of this pandemic. Uh, the economic um, stimulus packages have helped, but physicians' offices in many cases are small businesses, just like the other small businesses that have been hurt, you know, so badly in this pandemic. But um, uh, but there's burnout. Um, many are aware of the uh, Dr. Lorna Breen, um, the physician in, Fort, in New York who um, committed suicide last year. We don't have good numbers um, on what has happened with the suicide rate amongst um, physicians and other healthcare workers, but um, it, it, I'm sure it's not going down. Something quite remarkable that has occurred over the course of this year that has been underplayed um, is the fact that Pfizer, Moderna, uh, the two companies that have come up with approved um, uh, vaccines, the other companies that are working on this, have really worked at warp speed to come up with vaccines. I mean, this is, this is the stuff that Nobel Prizes are, uh, are made of. And, um, and we, we, we're obviously all relieved to have these vaccines. Talk for a few minutes about um, this quite remarkable scientific feat. 
It, it is stunning, Mike. Um, the, the fact that um, a year ago yesterday, um, scientists at Moderna first got uh, the mRNA sequence of the, the COVID-19 spike protein 365 days ago. Uh, and now uh, millions of vaccines are being given. One of the reasons uh, we were able to do this so quickly is that, believe it or not, we were almost in a plug and play situation at, at a year ago. Uh, research was being done on coronavirus vaccines for the past 10 years because of SARS and MERS. And so there were vaccinologists that were very familiar uh, with, the, with the coronavirus and also the technologies for uh, mRNA vaccines uh, were being developed. Uh, there have been vac mRNA vaccines before, they've just never been in widespread usage. There was one for Ebola, I, and I, there were some other diseases I can't think of right off the top of my head. So when the mRNA sequence was available January 11th of 2020, um, scientists were able to take that sequence of um, uh, nucleic acids and literally plug it in and make the vaccine from there. And, and the benefit of Operation Warp Speed is that um, they were able to eliminate the financial uncertainty from the situation because typically with vaccine development, you do a little bit of work and then the company will analyze the results and say, well, is this worth the investment to go forward? And then after a while, they'll say yes. And then they do a little bit more work. And, and those phases can take a real, a, a long period of time. We also got lucky in that we already had large clinical trial networks set up um, because of research that was being done with HIV. And so there were, um, so those um, clinical trial centers were able to be converted to coronavirus um, uh, vaccine trial centers uh, in, a, in an amazingly short period of time. And, and to me, that's, that's as stunning as any other part of this, the vaccine development process is the fact that starting in the late summer, you know, we were able to recruit um, a total of 70, 7,000 7, patients to participate in these trials um, and that so many of them completed it. And it is, it really is a stunning, uh, it's a stunning scientific achievement, but it, but every, you know, we all worked in this, the federal government played a huge role, um, you know, private uh, companies played a huge role and um, it's, and fortunately, for once, everything worked just the way it should. You mentioned earlier that there's no place for politics in um, defeating um, a, a, a pandemic of, of this sort. Um, yet we have not been able to separate the politics from from the pandemic uh, over the last year. That's a that's a high hurdle. Um, do you have thoughts about? how we might be able to go about this. You mentioned earlier also that basically everyone has been touched by this in one form or another, so it's harder and harder to, um, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to have a, uh, an improper belief that this doesn't exist uh, or that this is some sort of a hoax. Uh, but what are your thoughts on dealing with that to separate out the politics from, from the drive to beat the pandemic? I think the key is uh, in um, sticking to the science and listening to our public health um, authorities and all having, all singing the same song, all um, delivering the same message. Um, seeing um, our leaders at all levels, not just in the White House, but um, leaders in our local communities, in um, our schools and churches and uh, college campuses, um, all wearing masks and seeing them observing social distancing 
and and realizing that this is not about um, anything but the desire to get out of this pandemic and and get our country uh, back on the right track again. Um, I think it's, um, you know, uh, masks shouldn't be political. Going back to school shouldn't be political. Um, whether or not you uh, take a certain medication or not shouldn't shouldn't be political. Um, we, we need to stick to the science and listen to our public health authorities. Um, and I think that's going to be the quickest way out. You mentioned schools. Um, and uh, I'm wondering if the uh, AMA um, has um, issued any recommendations regarding uh, distribution of the vaccine to students uh, and, and teachers in our nation's schools and our universities. Uh, the AMA supports the, the recommendations uh, that were made by the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, um, which um, does have um, teachers, um, many of, of many teachers are going to fall in so-called higher categories, priority categories, because they may have chronic conditions or, you know, maybe, maybe older. Um, you know, one thing I think it's important for us, to, important for us to remember is that the Pfizer vaccine was approved down only to age 16. The Moderna vaccine was approved only to age 18. Um, so there are trials that are being conducted in the pediatric population. But right now, um, you know, for the most part, um, uh, children less than college age are not um, candidates for the vaccine um, at this at this time. So um, we don't have a, a, a plan for them, but um, uh, many college campuses have had uh, some great success uh, by with aggressive testing, uh, quarantining, um, and, and now being able to, to roll out shots for individuals more than 18 years of age um, have you know, really done a, a great job keeping COVID off their campuses. Thank you. Uh, we've spoken a couple of times now about journalists in the course of our conversation and our audience today comprises largely journalists, uh, some of whom have been on the front lines uh, covering uh, this story for the past year. What is if I may ask your assessment of the press coverage of the pandemic, and uh, a second part of that is, are there additional elements you would like to see brought to light? Uh, we could not come as far as we've come in this process uh, without the media and without wonderful um, journalism. Um, the fact that uh, terms like um, oh gosh, um, social distancing. Um, that was not a, a household word a year ago. Um, and there, and now, um, we hear people talking about, you know, incubation periods and we hear people that don't have a science background at all, uh, you know, discussing the benefits of one vaccine versus the other, um, you know, and I think uh, good journalism has been responsible for the dissemination of an incredible amount of information to the public uh, that we need desperately. Medicine and the media need to work together very closely uh, to make sure uh, that good, sound, science-based communication is made available. Uh, and so I'm, I'm very, very grateful for, um, you know, the wonderful work that has been done. Um, one request that I have personally is background photos and videos of needles. There are a lot of folks out there that are afraid of needles. And believe it or not, there will be people that don't get this vaccine because they're afraid of needles. Of course, they know that when they go in to get that shot, it's going to be a shot. Uh, but the, the, the imaging of needle after needle after needle uh, can actually fuel vaccine hesitancy uh, in some people. And so that's just a tiny little pet peeve of mine you asked, so, so I answered. Um, but I think as time goes on, the continuing uh, message of, um, you know, in local communities, 
where you can get the vaccine and how you sign up for it, um, what your uh, priority group is, um, you know, and these are messages that are going to have to be given over and over and over again. Uh, and then as time goes on, that message is going to have to evolve into more of a um, message to fight vaccine hesitancy for one reason or another. The good news is by then, with, there will be so many millions of people that have taken the vaccine and we will have um, a tremendous amount of safety and side effect data that we um, didn't have in such large numbers uh, before the end of the year. So hopefully that will help uh, make the journalist's job a little bit easier. I heard a wonderful story the other day as a, as a sidebar, but talking about the needles uh, and, and uh, people getting comfortable with, uh, with taking the medicine. Um, uh, that uh, 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 a boy came home in, in the early 1960s um, and um, uh, his father and his uncle were the composers of the music for uh, the film Mary Poppins. And, uh, and the father asked what the son did at school that day, and he said, I received my polio vaccine. And the doctor, uh, the father asked whether the shot hurt. And he said, I didn't receive a shot, I took a sugar cube. And the father thought about that, and the next day went in <clears throat> and wrote the song, A Spoonful of Sugar Helps the Medicine Go Down. Um, so Isn't that, amazing? that was a good public service campaign unto itself. And <laughs> perhaps we could use something like that today. I want to ask you the, the crystal ball question. Um, uh, if you want to take a, take a shot at this, what is a realistic timetable in terms of getting enough people vaccinated uh, that Americans could return to some semblance of normal life like family gatherings, working in their offices, using public transportation, going to the movies and feeling safe in restaurants or on airplanes? Well, a lot of it's going to depend on, on vaccine uptake and um, the self-discipline our society needs to continue doing the social distancing and masking measures it will need to do until, and one question is, well, when can we stop doing all that? And the answer to that question is, is that when the prevalence of the disease in your particular community has gotten low enough and the number of positive COVID tests has gotten low enough um, that it, it's felt that you can function in your community fine without uh, masks and social distancing. Uh, I, I think we're looking at probably at the end of this year. Uh, I'm hopeful that, you know, by fall, uh, we, you know, things will be a little bit, uh, it's not going to be completely back to normal, but um, I, I think things will have opened up and loosened up quite a bit as, uh, you know, as the Venn diagrams of those that have gotten vaccines get larger and larger and larger. You mentioned, um, you mentioned <laughs> earlier that when you talk with your patients, uh, you know, you ask them, take advantage of the fact that you're with a doctor and ask your questions. So we have some of those kinds of questions coming in uh, from, uh, from okay. some of our members. Uh, so um, here's the first one. I'm a 76 year old who has an allergic reaction to bees plus I take, I think I'm pronouncing it right, uh, correctly, uh, uh, Dilantin. Uh, and uh, I cannot take the flu vaccine. Should I get this vaccine? Yes. You might want to see an allergist first. Um, the, the allergic reactions that have been associated with um, the vaccines now, we think um, have something to do with the very unique lipid, um, you know, fatty uh, envelope around those snippets of messenger RNA. Um, even though I said we have used this technology in some vaccines, they've never been commercially available on a wide scale. Um, and so we are, um, are not seeing any relationship between an insect sting allergy and reactions to the vaccine. Um, most medication allergies uh, seem to not have anything to do with the vaccine. Um, one ingredient that we think might be responsible is polyethylene glycol or PEG, P-E-G. Uh, it's an ingredient that can be found in lots of different uh, medications, but it's one of the um, most important ingredients in 
the, the prep for colonoscopy. And uh, there's also some uh, constipation remedies that have medications like this in them. Um, and so we uh, hopefully will be able to develop a test to see who is susceptible for, to allergic reactions for the vaccine. But um, at this point in time, all we're recommending for individuals that have histories of allergies to medications, uh, foods, or you know, even vaccines, make sure the people that are giving you your, vac your COVID vaccine know that. Uh, if you have an adrenaline auto injector, uh, epinephrine, bring it with you uh, and make sure that the facility where you're getting the vaccine is equipped to uh, handle an anaphylactic reaction should it occur. Thank you. And uh, we have some uh, questions on broader issues as well, some of which you've, uh, you've, you've touched on already. Uh, one, can you elaborate on what kinds of investments are needed to help reduce healthcare inequities in marginalized communities and people living in rural areas in the short term to reduce their risk of contracting COVID-19 as well as in the long term? Oh boy, um, do we have another hour? Um, I'd, I'd love to, to talk about that at length. Um, you know, the different types of investments are going to be very different. Um, I think that uh, in terms of many marginalized and minority communities are also um, urban communities. Um, and I heard at one point in time, someone say, well, you know, if, if we are distributing the vaccines to pharmacies, then, you know, everybody, you know, should be within five miles of one of these pharmacies. Well, not really. If you live in far West Texas, that's certainly not the case. Um, <clears throat> and if you live uh, if you don't have good public transportation or don't have um, uh, your own transportation, even five miles is prohibitive. So I, I think what we need to do right now is help stand up vaccine administration clinics in non-traditional areas. I think in many cases, we're going to need to bring the vaccine uh, to the people rather than bringing the people to the vaccine. Um, and so that means more smaller areas. And I think that eventually um, getting more private practice physicians and primary care physicians uh, to be able to administer the vaccines in their offices is, is going to be very helpful. But in the short term, investments in uh, pop-up, if you will, uh, vaccine administration sites, um, I think is going to be one of the quickest ways to, uh, to add some jet fuel to this plane. We have a two-part question um, that touches on some of what you just mentioned. Uh, in November, the uh, AMA declared racism an urgent public health care crisis. Um, what specific steps is the uh, AMA taking or recommending be taken to address the disparities in access to testing and vaccinations? And you just talked about stand-up clinics in, in areas. Uh, are, there other, are there other elements that are necessary? Um, yes, we, um, uh, the questioner is obviously familiar with the, the statement that we made in November, um, but our efforts uh, in health equity go back much longer than that. Um, several years ago, the uh, AMA Board of Trustees um, created uh, what we called the Commission to End Health Disparities. And one of the conclusions of that um, Commission was to establish a permanent center for health equity within the AMA. Um, and that center has just uh, finished its uh, first year in operation uh, and is helping the AMA embed health equity in everything that we do in education uh, and in fighting chronic disease. Um, and um, Basically, in terms of some of the specific recommendations, um, we are making recommendations to uh, for education of medical students, residents. First of all, uh, we know that people do better when they look like they're 
physician, and we are working with medical schools and residency training programs um, to increase minority uh, enrollment in, in medical schools and in residency training programs. Uh, we're helping to sponsor um, bias training in many of these institutions uh, to help the individuals that are there um, be able to get a good medical education in a, uh, in a healthy environment. Uh, we're also providing, uh, working on education for physicians offices to help them take a look at practices that they might be doing that might be unintentionally um, racist and helping them to develop anti-racist uh, practices. Um, we, the, the, the scope of this, of, of our work is going to be very, very great. Many of, much of it is just policy, but we have, um, um, we know that there's still a lot of work to be done and we're just scratching the surface. You mentioned earlier that the U.S. continues to break its own single day record uh, for new coronavirus uh, infections. At the current pace, when would you expect that our numbers might begin to fall? Um, and do you think, as some have suggested, that um, things are going to get worse before they get better? I am, what we're experiencing now is kind of, I've heard it called the third wave, but basically it's a surge on a surge on a surge. We've had surges in case numbers that have happened um, after every holiday. Um, it happened, you know, we first noticed it uh, Memorial Day. Um, and then we started advising people to not get together on the 4th of July, don't get together on Labor Day, because invariably we see cases spike um, after holidays. And then a couple of weeks later, hospitalizations go up. And then a couple of weeks after that, the number of deaths go up. Um, this is kind of COVID is, is a, a long, uh, a long, terrible process. And so we are now almost two weeks uh, after New Year's. And so I am hoping um, that once we see the surges of cases that we're in now, the case numbers will hopefully start to go down um, by the end of January. And uh, we may see continued increases in hospitalizations, however, since that always, that's a lagging indicator behind the number of cases. So um, the, the rest of January is going to continue to be very difficult. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can start to make some progress um, in, you know, we don't have a lot of holidays coming up, which I think is going to be very good. And more and more people being vaccinated will eventually help as well. And what do Americans need to know about this variant from, from the UK? What, what would be helpful for them to know? Um, the, the variant that was discovered in the UK, which has been, uh, it's called the B117 uh, variant, uh, just a, a lab uh, moniker. Um, we believe that it is a mutation that makes the virus latch on more firmly to the human cell. And so it makes it easier to catch, easier to spread. Uh, it doesn't make the disease worse. You're not more likely to be hospitalized um, or have a more severe course of your disease if you um, catch one of these new variants. It's just that, um, say if you're in a group of 100 people and um, the, the current strain, someone, you may infect, you know, two or three people, but with the new strain, you might infect twice as many or three times as many. Uh, and it, it's, the vaccine works for it, so that's great news. Um, and it just highlights the importance of wearing your mask, washing your hands, physically distancing, avoiding large indoor gatherings, because that's where you catch COVID. And uh, even uh, a more communicable form of COVID, which these new variants are, um, uh, is no match for you know adequate public health safety measures. We have a couple minutes left. Um, we recently spoke with the director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Francis Collins. Um, who said that the principles of faith and science are <clears throat> complementary. The faith of a lot of people has been shaken 
uh, over, over the past year. How do you approach this and what do you say to people? Oh boy, um, it's, I think that, you know, one, if this pandemic has taught us many things, uh, but I think one thing that it has taught us is that we need to not only take care of ourselves, we need to take care of each other. And um, we need to realize that the actions, individual actions can have an impact on very, very large groups of people. Um, and so wearing a mask and washing your hands and social distancing uh, is not an act of selfishness. It's an act of faith. It's an act of kindness. Um, it's, it's an act of hope. And I um, and I'll choose hope any day. Um, and so I, I, it's made us realize that um, that we're really all the same, that um, even though there are races and groups of of our population who are more prone to severe disease uh, through no fault of their own, uh, the fact is, is that COVID does not discriminate. Uh, COVID um, will attack any of us and can attack any of us. And um, that, you know, that we're all in this together. We've got to work together uh, and take care of each other. Thank you. One of our grandsons turned four years old yesterday and we um, spoke um, on FaceTime with him last night and we asked him what his birthday wish was. And he said, I wish the virus would go away. Um, so let's hope his wish comes true. Out of the mouths of babes. Um, yeah. Soon, yeah. Uh, that'll be our last word today. Dr. Susan Bailey, president of the American Medical Association, thank you so much for joining us. And we are pleased to present you virtually with our National Press Club coffee mug. We'll send it to you, um, along with our hope that you will join us again in person in the very near future. Thank you and great good luck. Thank you. Our thanks to producer Lindsay Underwood, our headliners team co-leaders Donald Lainwan Leger and Lori Russo, and to our wonderful National Press Club team behind the scenes here in the Broadcast Operations Center. We thank our members and guests for your questions and for joining us. Be well, stay safe, and have a good day.